All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to download the tier coding zip. Simply click on it to download zip. And it should pop up, okay? Give me a moment and I've... All right, let's do this very quickly um, since we're completely freestyling the session because of the change in computer wrap. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview on tier coding. Traditionally, uh, what I do is I tier code locally first, and then I switch to um, the online world. So what we're going to do now is we're going through like literally five or six slides to get an understanding of what we're doing. In short, you're using your phone, your Google Map, Google Maps app, and type in an address. I show you what's going what's going on behind the scenes, and then we're trying to do that. Huh? And then we're also trying to do, deal with the, start out with digitizing on the online world. Yeah? So quick lecture, digitizing online world, remind me about it, because I have no lessons planned, I'm freestyling here. Can happen, change in the environment. And then we're doing the geocoding part. Yeah? Because that's, one address is fine to put it on the map by hand, what are you doing with 50 or 5,000? I had a project recently with two million address points. So you gotta do a little bit different things with that. Yeah? Um, all right, so it's the process of creating geometric representation for locations, duh, put the address as a point on a map. Yeah? Um, use a computer program or geocoding engine. Some people use that as Google. Some people wrote that as a software developer. Huh? Or some people are just using what we have, the Geocode World <laughs> Engine with ESRI. Uh, we have actually two, we have one for real estate and we have one for ESRI. Real estate one I'll build. Um, we'll see how that works. All right, examples. Survey of visitors and arts event. Maps the zip codes to determine where to focus marketing activities. For hospitals, uh, determine where to open a satellite clinic maybe based on your customers right now, where are they coming from? We are in the Orlando vicinity. Huh? I'm pretty sure Universal Studio will give you a different marketing campaign here in, in Broward County, based on your, on your zip code and your, and your address, than in Michigan. Huh? Simple differentiation. They put it on the map. They know where the people are coming from. And then you add all the other awesomeness. Huh? If you've been visiting already, if you have a season pass, family associated, they know it's not just one person, maybe it's five persons. Hotel offerings are going to be different then. Huh? One thing you can do with that is, well, use GIS and you can pair up all this data. Huh? For us, simple thing, MLS data. Take, a zip, take just simply the zip codes of all the MLS data you're looking at and aggregate the, the, the sales price or the asking prices right now, and you have an idea. You can do that in a table, but you also could map that out and say, oh, look at that zip code, that's gonna be a hotspot right now, or what's going on? There's nothing happening there. Yeah. Same thing with store chain locations. You can use that for the map competitors. If we have enough time today, we're doing Burger King and McDonald's. Why not? Yeah. And others. Everything that has a physical location in the world and it has a address, a unique identifier, could be a gas meter ID number, I can map out. Gas meter, gas meter ID number is a little bit complicated because you need to have a street address associated with that. No? But still, I can make that association between utility at a address and the house at a address. Again. 100 Main Street is one point on the map. Unless 100 Main Street is a condominium tower with 140 units, then the TIS geeks are putting 141 addresses on that building. For each suite or condominium, one address number, one dot. Condos are a pain in the butt. That's French for very complicated digitizing uh, or addressing. Uh, I've done 911 calls. Condominiums are really, really not my friends. And that's 15 years ago. Uh, hasn't changed much. But we'll see. 
All right. Typical data we see. Address tables. Yeah. This is actually a table from a feature class. But you can see here easily that the street name of the business as an example, the zip code, what type it is, etc. Everything I want. The basic I need is a solid street address. House number, name of the street, direction of the street. All these little so-called tokens. Yeah. Um, if it's just main street or Las Olas, Google is putting it somewhere in the middle of Las Olas. Probably 50% where things it should come out. And that is relatively along the street. It's important to understand. Relatively along the street. Do we have a whiteboard in this one? If I say main street, it might block it here. Why? Because it's 50% relatively of that street. If it's 10, it might be here. If it's 90, it might be here. 99 will be here on that corner. Or actually, maybe if it's set up right on top of the building. Street address. Point address. Point address is the best thing you can have. It's like literally going with a GPS unit over this desk and click, shoot the lead log for you. Yeah. That's the most accurate you can have. So whenever we do geocoding and it suddenly says state versus zip versus point address, state doesn't matter. State is the state of Florida. Zip code would be zip code for Davy or the university, the whole campus, versus this library room, this number, dot on the building. Yeah? And then everything else in the address will help with um, finding who to get. We can use center lines, and explain that. We can use zip codes. Paying on your project is good enough. If you want to show the hottest zip codes in real estate sales, use zip codes. You don't need street addresses. Same process, but granularity is different. And you aggregate already into the 50 zip codes for Davy. Yeah? That one campus zip code, 50 units, it's going to be a count of 50 then on a dot. So there are different processes. Again, it depends what you want to map out. <sighs> Visuals for real world versus geocoding it. This is the process. Yeah. Creating geometric representation. Yeah. You put the address in. Address in 100 Main Street. The geocode engine that is trained to know the real world. This only works if it's trained for the real world. My 2 million uh, data points. I built a geocode engine only for one state specifically. Yeah. So let's say I built this for the state of Louisiana. A address from Mississippi did not get accounted. It falls through because the real world is not recognized in that pattern. Yeah. Prior knowledge about the real world is important. Knowledge about the real world for you is important as well to make sure that this is really Davy and not, let's say, Miramar, where the dot ends up. Sometimes you have outliers because sometimes those geocode engines are not perfect. And you have to understand, that, hey, where is this coming from? Why, why are you sitting in Minnesota? Huh? Sometimes you delete that guy. Sometimes you have to work with that guy. That's pretty much the, con the concept. Again, here, different addresses, different components or tokens. Yeah. And the last slide on this one, we did this, we did this, we did this, we did this, we did this. Where are the places? Possible errors to help you stay sane with this. Fifth Avenue could be a typo. Sawmill Run Boulevard yeah. could be 
Run or Boulevard? Uh, place names. What's the street address for the White House? 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, correct. Yeah. So it could be geocoded as White House if your engine recognized places, or you need to put in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Heinz Field, baseball people. Empire State Building, see? Got to look that up. Could be also that you have the same zip code in the last row, same zip code, uh, sorry, same address, different zip codes, because there are many main streets in America. You gotta know which one it is. Uh, if it's Main Street Davy or Main Street Fort Lauderdale, as an example. Could be the same street, but it changes zip codes because it changed uh, the boundaries. Sounds trivial, trivial. Everything okay? You understand that? All right. Don't do that. We don't do that. There we go. 100 odd Rooney Avenue is Heinz Field. Good. So, let's change a few things up. Did download this. What I'm going to do is I go show in folder. Actually, I open this up. And clean up a little bit my computer. So open up my C drive. You guys want to follow that, please. Going to use a new folder and just call it GC GIS because we're in a different lab. Let's just be completely lazy with it. So geocoding GIS. So we have that locally. Double click on this. So I have on one side, I have my, my empty work folder. I have my compressed folder here. Double click into GIS, geocoding session until I see this here. And I simply select them with shift, mouse, left mouse click, and then drag and drop them over. If you have issues with that, Go the similar route with the 7-zip, win-zip process, uh, as in my downloads, let me demonstrate this again, my downloads, right-click on it, extract all or extract two. That's a step in between. If you have done the extract, you see something like this folder, you could also open up this folder. Rem Sorry, this is like a rushing nesting doll right now by a mistake. It's geocoding session, it's geocoding session, then comes the data. Double click here. You see this, something with small wrapper, and then some parcel DBF, some parcel table as a uh, Excel spreadsheet. Okay. And with track and drop of all of them, highlight all of them, track and drop over, you have that. Everyone is on the same page with me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I just dragged and dropped it over into my local work, my local work temp. All right. I extracted the geocoding session and I dumped it into my work file. As I call it GC GIS. I got it from Canvas, yeah. Download from Canvas. On the data. Yeah. All right. So while the others are catching up, let's take a look at what we have in there. Yeah. Let's open up Arc. You can't open up Arc Pro. Let me open up Arc Pro. Let me show you the spatial stuff. Let's explore the non-spatial stuff in a second. So while Arc Pro is loading, I see two different files down here. Yeah. It says some parcels.dbf, that's dbase format, and some parcels table, and it says Microsoft Excel. Let's open up that Microsoft Excel for demonstration purposes. And if I go in, 
I have weird names here. Um, I have to make arrangements. Where are you? You don't like me much. So take a look at this. So the first row is parcel numbers, assessment year, and then we have like delegate value, um, land value, land units, different land square footage numbers. But we also have a file here or some f fields that says physical address one, physical address two, physical city. And if you don't mess up like I did with the uh, sizes, you see physical SIP. Yeah. So wait a minute, we just talked about geocoding. What do we need for geocoding? Addresses. So we have a list of 100 something addresses. Yeah. This is raw data I got. Yep. Magic hands in GIS. Not all data is equal. Huh? So yeah, some somewhere from the down county I found that. And use this for a training example. All right. Um, if you look at if you look it up, it's a uh, county assessors data crossed over with the taxation role, tax role. Took that out from a larger project. Yeah. Again, 400 points, something. Uh, it's good enough to make a mess in data management and in processing your work. All right, so we're cool with that uh, Excel table. We can use an Excel table directly in uh, Arc Pro. We can actually also use it directly in the online world. All right, so we're cool on that. Good, and there's data inside, very important. Once you start downloading data, always look if it's an empty shell or if it's actually occupied. Uh, could be just a table and saying here, first row. Don't want to save anything. So we got that. If you, give me a moment, have only a DBF file. Yeah. If you double click this, depending on your computer, because I program on this machine, it comes up with this mess. Yeah. On your computer, it says can't open or find me an application. DBF can be read in an Excel, but you gotta do a trick. You gotta open up in Excel a blank workbook and then track and drop that DBF file over. And if it's well behaved, wait, this is the right one here. If it's well behaved, you get the same thing like we had before. Yeah, I did click, click the first one. See, this is what you would get. So to make this easy, open up a blank Excel file, track and drop helps in the Windows environment. Uh, here, the DBF, DBF file. Uh, this is the DBF file. This is actually looks, didn't see the ending. This is an XML file. Structured marked up language file, uh, completely different thing. Don't even worry about it. What you want to look at is the DBF. Uh -huh. Okay. So still recording this? Yeah. In the geospatial world, let's take a look at this folder in the geospatial world because we had other files here. Small wrapper, yeah. By the way, that's the master solution for the exercise. Let's just add that data. Catalog. No, no, that's the um, that's a pro. Let's just do. Let's simply overwrite this map. Add data. Just want to show you this very quickly. If I want to take a look at my GCGIS, here's my Excel spreadsheet. You can see this on the uh, ending. This is my DBF table. Your GIS locally can read DBF tables directly. 
and this is a small wrapper as a small um, overview which when I add that I do the zoom to I need my glasses I don't have that here similar like in the assignment today this is kind of a focal, focal area and you can change the symbology for this and say hey, it's only don't want to do an outline so you can play around in that area then yeah again if you open up data that will look like sorry this is Chris too many binders of if you look at data and extract data you want to take a look at what you look and preview the data huh? small wrapper on the local machine we will use it for the online version we don't okay let's fire up a browser let's open up Chrome and go to arcgis.com sign in oh yeah Okay. All right, so I am improvising here, at least on my side. Going on the online web page, uh, once you're logged in, uh, going home, and you can see typical setups gallery, map, scene, groups, and content. Huh? I want to do for the next five to ten minutes, I want to give you a quick rundown on digitizing in ArcGIS online. Uh -huh. So, if I go to my content, everyone logged in? Everyone can follow? Perfect. This will look different from you guys because I did some damage here. Uh -huh. that, that is my two million data point project. So, even for here, you can see this all the other things um, okay I want to click on my content and say create and it comes up with variations of two uh, features we can create it's like right click new yeah? and I want to create a feature layer <clears throat> I have various various versions and act uh, applications. Uh, we had earlier this morning someone asking about utilities. Well, the gas, electric, already as predefined templates. Yeah. I can search for elements. I search for points. Point. Yeah. If I do that, ground control, that's GPS and flyover stuff. Point lines, polygons, that's a multi-feature layer. We don't want to touch that. Stay in one sandbox at a time. Uh -huh. I'm going to select points. Build a feature layer for collecting point data after creating the empty layer defined fields, domains as needed and start collecting data. That's something like we did before. We did that with cars. Uh -huh. Click a point, put the color of the car in. This is a little bit different, slightly more fun. So I click create. It says create a point layer. Next. Now I can actually define which area of the world it should be, be at home. Right now, I don't care. It's okay. Meaning I can digitize in California and in Florida if I set this up. Just say next. All right. Here, this is the pane. In the setup, how we built this for the organization, you know, no file name can be redundant. That means whatever we do, and we say, hey, these are traffic lights. You can't name traffic lights 25 times. 
You gotta name it by a code. I prefer to use your initials at the end. Huh? Fun fact, we actually have at least two people in the room with the same initials, A-M. Huh? So in that case, use your three initials if you have a middle name, huh? to make this stick that is really you. If you get an error message as in, you can't create this or error in creating feature class, it is a name problem, usually. Huh? So we're going to get 25 times now points test underscore initials or points test initials. Huh? So I'm going to do points test, not points, points test TW on the top left as title. All right. Everyone got that? Crystal clear? Cool. Because we use a template, we have here a tag called data collection. The biggest pain ever. You cannot create this without a tag. It will bug you until you say, call it test or whatever. Yeah? So we can use data collection because it's predefined. Summary, you, know, you can write something in there. Right now, save in folder. This is similar like you do this in Windows, when you say save in documents, save in downloads, save in on the C drive. I have multiple folders, and multiple projects. I actually then can go in and coordinate that. Yeah? Right now, I don't care, I just dump it into the main folder. That's a test. 100,000 tests later, you need to clean up your machine. All right? That said, click done. Takes a moment. Takes two moments. Ta-da. Pardon? Service name, then change the name. Points, test, and with your initials. Did you add your initials? All right, let me get, help you. Thank God for middle initials. I don't have any. All right. So, got that. Typical screen. You can take a look here, explore this. There's nothing in there right now. If there would be a table in there, we actually would see what's going on. The template actually helps us to attach photos and files. Visualization is nice and funny once it actually is populated. Give me. And then settings is also interesting. Please don't click on this one. If I delete your account, I have to go in there step by step by feature. Huh? And do not click delete item either. Huh? I rather have 100 copies with different underscores, numbers, than for training purposes, lose your data. This is a big bucket. I got enough data po online points to pay for the storage. Yeah, so don't don't be cheap and delete data. If it's error data, if it's not the right way, rename it, keep it as a backup. Yeah. Last thing you want to do is in doing your training sessions is losing data. You think it's wrong, and it's maybe perfect solution. Yeah. All right. So the cool thing is we have all these options here on the side. We can export the data if we want to. We can update the data. We can publish it to the wide, wild world web. We don't do that. It's a training session. But we can actually put this in Map Viewer. Map Viewer is pretty much what we do here as the map. Let's click on this. You also can click here. Both works.
All right? And it's super simple. Find a spot I want to click on. As in Boca, Pompano, Fort Lauderdale. This is Port Everglades. This is 75, 595. I zoom in a little bit more like this. Not perfect. I can do a um, bookmark. Called point test. Why? Because if I zoom out again and I click just on point test, it jumps right where it was. Oh, same function bookmarks we have in Arc Pro. Oh, so there, with navigation, etc., the setups are similar. All right. Super simple thing. Broad College, University Drive. We scroll down here. And we see 30th Street. This is where we're at right now. All right. Then I click on point tests. Look at this. See the different buttons showing up again. And I know we have done this only briefly. Uh, uh, but I also can go in here and say show the table. No data found. Why? We haven't created it yet. It's an empty shell. Uh, so what I can do is now I go to edit. It says add, change, and or remove features. Go to edit, like the create feature template on your bro, you come in here and say new feature. And just let's say click on any random building, come on, give me the point, activate it, click on here. So this is a template. The template was trained to actually now choose a file for attachment. Let's repeat this again. I go up here, click on my edit session. Don't? Who does not have an edit? Give me a moment. Uh, that's, that doesn't matter if I keep recording it. In the content, we created a point, point layer, a point test. Yeah, same thing again. I am here, details, point test needs to be in your content. I go and edit, activate the feature here, and just say, you know what, click to edit. And say, close. So it's very simple, very straightforward like we did in uh, Arc Pro. If I go back to details and click on this little table icon that says show table, if you don't see this, it might be hidden in a, with that X um, little arrow. Yeah. Click on table, now I should see two objects and I even can go in and now add a photo. I just don't want to do that for time purposes. Here yeah, under under content, points layer, height table, open table. Same thing. I can change my symbology, change the style. Yeah, let's give you guys. Yeah, if you if you have changed style. You can go now, same thing, looks more funny. This is like beautiful. You could do that on the iPad if you want to. It's online. You can do this in Safari. You can do this on your Mac at home. Yeah, this is browser based, web browser based. I recommend Chrome to do that. Yeah. I can change the options and say, you know what? I want to change my symbols and I want to make literally orange stars and want to have them really, really big. Give me one moment to show you. Here, this little thing, it's called change styles. Yeah? Typical example of be curious and just hover over with your mouse what is behind there. This one says filter. 
This one says cluster the points. This one says perform analysis, which is the same button like here. Yeah, the three dots is more options. The three dots are your hidden friends. Yeah, look at that. That's like the right click we have in Pro. All this you can change and f make fun with it. Yeah. So they really, really streamlined that, made that really, really forward in terms of workflow. Yeah. There are certain functions you need to understand that where they are at by location. Yeah. So again, sometimes you see a little triangle sitting in front of here. You gotta go in and say, click on it and open up everything. Yeah. Don't be surprised that it might look here like this. Or, oh, where's my data? I don't see it. Go to content. Sometimes it might appear like this. Yeah. No panic. Click on details and go back in. Huh? So this is as simple as you can digitize points in the ArcGIS online world with a ready-made template. You can add field names to it. You can make changes to it. Yeah. Um, super straightforward. I encourage you guys just to play with it. Find places you worked at, places you like to hang out, and just say, okay, fine, this is my exercise. Yeah to practice this workflow. Worst case, if you have no places to hang out for, or eat out and all that, you just go in and say, you know what, I take all the buildings of the university and put a dot on top. Same process would be for Polygon. Huh? Open up, the, create, create a feature class, feature layer, take the Polygon template, plug it into your map. Any questions about this? All right. Let's do a little bit more complicated things. We do have that Excel table, don't we? Yeah. So we have multiple points right now. We save that map. Save it as points map with your initials. If you save this, see that you must give at least one tag. I call it points. And save the map. All right. Any questions so far? <clears throat> what, what do you suppose to put for the tag? I put points or test. A lot, if you look for data collections, there's a lot of test. It's the easiest way to type with two fingers with two fingers on the left hand, test. Huh? Not a big fan of that tag feature. Alright. Okay. So Another cool element is the create presentation. I'm not going to go into depth, but think about this. If you can bookmark a specific map, bookmarks here, yeah, with create presentation, yes, save. You could now, with multiple bookmarks and multiple setups, do like almost like an online PowerPoint presentation with just viewer maps and information. Remember when we did in the beginning, we did the um, story maps? That's something in between. Huh? But be careful. Why don't we like this kind of feature? <coughs> because it's purely online. What are you going to do if you're in a, on a computer that is disconnected? Someone brings in a laptop conference or presentation in the conference room. You have no internet. Last resort is your static PowerPoint screenshot. Yeah? So I would always recommend to have a backup. Don't depend on the online stuff. As fancy as it can be, don't. Don't save your PowerPoint presentation as Google Docs the day you present in class. Have it ready on a jump drive, huh? just in case to not, our projectors went down. Huh? What do you do? If you have to change the room and I have all of my data on the other computer, can jump drive or Dropbox or OneDrive or whatever it's called. All right. 
Let's do some geocoding. Let's put some more points to the map than just two mouse clicks. Yeah. Been a while that we did this. This is next week. I'm going home, going to content. In folders, I create a new folder. Here, this little button. Create a new folder. And call it geocoding. Create folder. Down here. The little button here on folders. Geocoding. By the way, nuts. Down here. Uh, national unit something. It's a European thing. It's actually European regions. Yeah. Has nothing to do with pecan or walnut. All right. So, for the process of geocoding, I need my source data. I need a address list. We do have that address list. Yeah. That is that table we have in our folder in GCGIS uh, that we downloaded from Canvas. So what I want to do is now. I'm going to add item here, add item, click on geocoding. So we're in that folder, similar like Explorer. Add item from my computer. And I get a choose file. Search my binder, gcgis. Oh. And let's do an Excel table. That's some parcel table, yeah, and click open. Okay, what did we learn earlier when we created our points test? No two unique names are allowed. So right now, populated as a title, some parcels table. If I click OK before you do, you will not be able to create that. So for the purpose of the training in here, we are going to add initials. Every time we create some content, every time we add items to it, from let's say an upload, we are going to add our data. Did we start this again? Yeah. All right, some parcels table. I would go with initials, and if initials are redundant, to make sure uh, with, with middle name initials, three digits, chances are slim that we have three, two people double. Yeah. Okay, so tags, geocoding. Now, this guy is really sneaky on us. Locate the features by coordinates, addresses, or places, or none, at just a table. So, we have not uploaded that data yet, but it already recognizes, uh oh, uh oh, there are addresses in there. You might want to do something with it. Let's do that. So, if I scroll down, it asks me for location fields. And remember, we looked that up. I know that physical address one could be used as a address or a place. That's the reason why I say take a look at the data first you're working with. You need to know which field is now your city or your zip code. Physical address one would be mapped or what we call field this is what we look what we are looking at right now is what we call a field map as in input fields and original data fields original data needs to meet certain restrictions and requirements so i want to know the name of the person we don't have that but let's say what's the address where where would which field in your excel table 
contains 100 main street that I call the address. And I match that. Now that's what I do here. This is the field in my table. I'm going to use it as the address. Exactly. If I give you an Excel spreadsheet that says address and city, the system will recognize it automatically because it's looking for city address zip code. Yeah? The beauty of this exercise is you need to understand how to map those fields that they get, get connected. Yeah? That's what we do in the next one. Physical address, we didn't use that. We don't have that. Yeah? So, physical city is in our table. We could use that as what? As a city. Then a physical zip code, we could use that as zip. What's the zip for? So it can pull up the zip code that has come from the data. The zip for is that two different in the United States are two different zip code systems. Huh? Regular zip. There's 33314. The dash point number. The zip 4 would be 33314-5628 three, 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 as an example. This is the 4. That is the U.S. Postal Service, the United States Postal, Postal Service routing number. No extension with phone numbers. This is a USPS internal thing. Yeah? More, more detailed than this one. Will be kind of the sector of that parcel carrier. Make it in layman terms. We need that five digit zip code. Sometimes also called five zip. Zip code is good enough. And this very technical, but this gives you the understanding as in. Don't select zip, zip four. Don't you, don't unless you have everything in the table like this. Always go like that. That's good enough for us right now. For the real estate purposes we are doing here, economic purposes, that's the regular zip code we use. Okay. So we plug that in, map the fields. Zip turns into a phys or physical zip code turns into a zip. All right, we are not worried about the time zone right now. Let's review this on the top again. I selected a table I provided for this exercise, an Excel table. I renamed it with my initials to make sure that it don't clash with data names. Huh? I gave it a tag. Yes, for the training purposes, we are going to publish this. Huh? Then you're going to use this and probably disconnected all of that. No, left it. We've mapped out at, to use at physical address one as address and place. Physical city name, named as a city. Physical zip code as a zip code, not as a zip four. Zip code. And then I click item. All right, all right, review the location fields. Yeah, this is about the geocoding process. This is about the geocoder using these fields, the geocoding engine that puts the address on the map, wants to know where which field is the address. It will carry over all the associated fields. It will not lose the parcel number uh, or the assessment here. But for putting it on the map, you need that reference, which one is what. All right, so I have this name already in the system, so I call it version two. Add item. Takes a moment. 
In a perfect world, it will finish this and tells me 392 selections were matched. Do you want to review the match locations? I'm going to click no, because in a perfect world, I would have 100% geocoded. 100% geocoded or matched does not mean that they're perfectly matched. Here, could be a set of 100 Main Street as a point address, could be Main Street only. We did look into the table earlier and we knew that there are street addresses. Uh, so if I go now to content, just to give you that idea, I have my table and I have my feature layer that I just created. So it didn't overwrite that, it made a copy. So if I look at my table again, I, it's actually just a file, I could I download this. Do I have the Excel file open again here, GS. Here, those are all with numbers in there. This one, as an example, is a street address. Yeah, it's missing the number. So it's definitely gonna mess up my work. The purpose of this training exercise is to show you the workflow of geocoding. I don't expect perfect match. Yeah? It's gonna be fine. All right, so if I go back to my content, Go back to, oh, damn it. to my feature layer. Same view like you have, lots of funny red dots. If I click open that in map viewer, I get these guys. That takes a moment depending on the scale. So I have a few outliers. I could examine those, if just click on them. So now here, Kenny, this is the table. The table is still there. Yeah. So I could take a look at what's going on. So this, this one here, the physical address is actually I-595, nothing else but the zip code. So why is the zip code uh, uh, Because the system right now thinks it's a uh, number. Yeah. Because we came in from Excel, we didn't say it's text versus number, so I picked that up. Yeah, but all these guys look pretty okay. Yeah, so if we would add another item, as an example, can we do this straight from here? Let's do this from our content. Let's go to content, add another item from my computer. Choose a file. There's this. Uh, we got a zip code. Zip that. I click on small wrapper. Does it? Got to do this differently. I go to JCGIS. Sorry about the mishappening. This is the, that little trick you forget. If I look at my GC GIS in front of me on my local computer, we gotta do one step in between. Guess what? We gotta compress it. We gotta sip it. I take this part down to small wrapper with shift and left mouse click. I highlight those. Gesundheit. Then I right click on them and say send to Compress zip folder. Okay. So compressed, how many compressed one, two, three, Everything that starts with small wrapper. Oh. Yeah. Once this is compressed, I gently click on this again so I can change its name. And I call it my initials. on the back. Compressed Compress folder. Send to, to compress folder. Send to compress folder. Yes, I did. And you have to highlight all of them to do that. So, 
was is the only critical phase in uploading shape files. So I have this small wrapper TW. I go back to my content, choose my file, and click on my compressed zip folder. Only once and say open. So now you can see the jump in the in the form. You can't upload the five single files of a shape file. You have to put them into a compressed folder or a zip file. Yeah. No, ArcGIS Online. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or you can publish it. It's a different step. We can do that. It's in the book. Um, we can do that later. Not today. Mm -hmm. yeah? So, if I compress this in a zip file and tell Arc Online, GS Online here, hey, add an item. It will take a look inside the zip file and will recognize what type could be in there. And then it changes the form. See that? I say, upload this. It changed the content. I can choose between other contents. Yeah? Right now, it's going to be a shape file. Later, I can give you a whole shear database and say, here's a can of data. All of that. Plug them in. Huh? So, then we're doing just the same thing. Going to give it a title, picks up the name already. That's the reason why I renamed it with initials before I did the upload. It might error out, might th gives us some trouble. Got to do some tags. Well, geocoding or wrapper, doesn't matter. It's a geocoding session, so we can call it geocoding. Yeah, right. And click the Add Item button. In a perfect world, if there's no redundant name in the universe, then we'll find this and create this. <laughs> yep, doesn't matter what you, we're doing a recording session. All right. I'm a little bit, little bit impatient, so I actually go back to map. Perfect world, it kept when I click on top here on map. Now I can say add data, search for my layers. Again, this is like the add data button in Arc Pro. Yeah. So instead of local, instead of portal, it shows me these. So if I say search for layers, I can pick the small wrapper, the late, the last edition. Click on that. I can read what is about this is about, or I just say plus here or add to map. All right, I do this again. Hey, that's the reason why we're here. We're doing this multiple times. Okay. All right, I was here. I was here in content. All right. I was impatient. I didn't want to wait for this one. All right, guys. If you you're asking me to repeat this, then please then watch it again. All right, Kyle. It's not a base. It's not. Watching it twice helps. All right, I didn't want to wait until it's done. I will click here on map. Click once. It loads my map. The perfect world. It kept the geocoded addresses as my dots. Then I add data. Click on the add data button. I search for layers. The way I set this up is it goes into your content, then in the organization, unless you choose others. So I can search for that, or I can search, go down here and take a look at what I have done in my account. Here, the small wrapper pops up. If I click on it, it gives me all simple mouse clicks. Don't, don't be trigger happy. Click, 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 click. Doesn't work. Yeah. So I can, read up if I made changes here, or I click the little button here, 
or I click the big button here. Both will work. It's plus is add data. Two different layers. Two different layers I can move around. There we go. Yep. Two different layers I can move around. See that? Again, remember, we cut the real world into slices and dices and layers and put them together like a cake. Yeah. So, here, what I could do now is everything that is outside, what I like, by the way, is symbology. That wrapper is see-through. It has transparency. Yeah. So I can go in here and change the style. I can make changes here to the, the options. I can change the transparency if I want to. Yeah. When, when I do really want to see it or not, I click OK and done. Yeah. So it's very flexible, very handy. It comes in with some visuals that are appealing. Uh, in Arc Pro, it's like, ugh. Everyone got their wrapper today in the assignment or in the quiz as a solid thing. You had to change the symbology. You didn't see what's underneath it. Uh, so super straightforward. All right. That somewhat concludes the little exercise on online geocoding. Pretty straightforward. Take a look, get an Excel table at an A address list. Verify that you have valid addresses inside. Add that table to ArcGIS Online. ArcGIS Online is like, hey, this is a table of addresses. Would you like to geocode? Yeah. Match those fields. Which one is the physical address? That field name could be named Carl Gustav. We have to say, this is my address field. Huh? Donald Duck is my city address, my city field. Could be awkward, completely crazy names. Match them in the field map, or location fields. Make sure that you don't have redundant names in the system. Your initials help. Fire it up. Wait a few minutes, three seconds. Bam, you have funny looking dots on the map. Right now, we don't really know what are these dots are. We think it's addresses, but it could be utility buildings. It could be McDonald's. It could be single family home addresses with value attached to it for real estate. Huh? All of this is fair game. All right, sneak preview for the next few weeks. Analysis. I could do proximity. I could create buffers. And I could go in and say, give me the distance of, let's say, 500 feet tables. Here, some parcels tables is my dots. Yeah, 500 feet. And here, this is why I insist that you guys get the GIS lab fee. Because now I look at the credits, this operation will cost you 3.4 credits. Sorry, 0.4 credits or 0.38 for the four, almost nine, uh, 400 points of geocoding. If I run my analysis, takes a moment. So what it does is now it takes every point on that map I will draw a buffer of 500 foot distance in a circle around it. Let me change the settings to dissolve and uh, solve, dissolve and non-dissolve. I didn't see that, so probably not. So I get now 384 little circles and a whole visual mess because I did not say overlap and dissolve. Think about um, if you do dissolve, see these overlaps? Those are single units right now. If I would do a dissolve, let's get rid of the small wrapper so you can see this better. 
Here, apparently, I have multiples because the color is darker because I have overlaps. You can see this here nicely, how many times overlap is darker, darker, darker. There is a function called dissolve, which would now take at this point and take out all of that overlap. Yeah. If I want to take a look at, let's say, coverage areas of cell phone towers or fast food restaurants in walking distance, I am not interested in, say... I am not interested in this one and this one and this one and this one. All of this area is walkable distance to those four locations. If I live here, I'm outside of that buffer. We're going to get into that in the next few weeks really in detail. Uh, this is the first stage. Next stage would be drive time, uh, which we can do as well. If we would say here are small parcels. Uh, analysis, which is that button here again, so I perform analysis. Uh, plan, uh, where was it? Plan routes, find locations. We can do all of these different elements. We, yes, please. You gotta know which one is what. All right, let's do this again. Analysis, proximity, create buffers. Got to select here. Yeah. So some parcels was our idea. Distance, let's do this again for feet. So you can actually see the, we have that moment to visualize it. Options, here we go. Overlap, dissolve. And I just call it buffer too. For demo purposes. So all these blues are going to be now four dots with one buffer only because they re-dissolve them. Think about that. Tomorrow morning when you make breakfast, eggs and bacon, that is one egg, that is one egg, that is one egg. If your eggs in the frying pan are too close, what is the egg white doing? It dissolves with each other. Now you get two or three egg yolks, and the egg white. You got that? Okay, I okay, how do I undo if I have done it? You can't undo it. You gotta redo it. <laughs> so, where are my buffers? See that? Change the layout. Change the symbol, let's make this a little bit orangey. Yeah, in orange are my dissolved buffers. And I can put the blue ones on top. And in my legend, you can see orange versus blue. So now, I also remember when I did the analysis, I said, use extent only. Why? Because it only rendered now my oranges, orange buffers, see that? In this area. That's a really cool fail safe. If I have 50,000 points all over the US, every time I do that, procedure, and by accident I do it wrong, I have to do it 50,000 times. I pay 50,000 times. You know? If I'm doing this just for Broward County, on the map I'm looking at, that's the current map extent. One reason why I'm using tools like what I call the wrapper, it's literally a simple draw a feature class, draw a feature layer. That is my extent I want to work in. So I'm always in that kind of window or frame. Well, costs you three, four minutes to set this up. Remember, it's just right click new feature class, create that. Saves time in the long run to get organized. Well, yes, please. How did you take all of the uh, blue layer and then how did you segment the back area versus the whole block? That's what I just explained. So. The blue area on and off is simple checkbox. 
like we do in a table of content in Pro. Huh? Tada, déjà vu. Different platforms, same workflow. Huh? The differentiation here is I ran the last buffers, the oranges, orange buffers. I ran that only for that map extent here. So I could also go out, do again the analysis. Use proxy, create buffers. Let's do something different. Stay 500 feet so it will look complete. Make sure you select the right thing. Small parcels. Don't just unclick use map current map extend. So what it will do now is we'll take all my points into account and run it. Yep, see, we did not rename this guy, buffer three. I unchecked the map extent. I'm running this on all about 400 points now. That's the reason why it will take a moment. Yeah, so I, if I zoom in, zoom in, zoom in with my mouse wheel, in just a few seconds, I expect everything here, all these guys will be connected because they overlap. But not all of them. Not all of them. Yeah. Not all of them. Some of them are custom. Yeah. And in the meanwhile, I save this whole thing. All right. Buffer two, buffer three. So if I unselect those guys and then choose the right direction, total blue means I meant choose kilometers. Remember I went up, also the typical demonstration problem. This one did probably 500 kilometers, yep, that can happen. The map unit, remember I went up Changed the number, showed you the table, it did reset my 500 feet. If that happens to you guys, something like this, the buffer distance unit was wrong. And nobody watches. Chatson, what's so important on your cell phone right now? Again, guys, we have limited time in this computer lab. Unless you have a babysitter, medical emergency at home, put those phones away. I reserve the right to kick you out. And then you watch the video. Huh? I'm okay with folks like them helping each other. I take a break, ask questions for that. But if you check out at 11.15 in the morning that you need to figure out what's going on in the World Wide Web, I don't do that until 4.30. So please stay focused with me. Again, panic button alert. If I get this in an assignment, my professor said, don't panic. I just selected the wrong linear units. I used probably 500 kilometers instead of 500 feet because I changed the tables in between the form that I changed. Yeah? This is really frustrating if something like this happens to you. That's the reason why this is the event of 120 miles per hour on the wall. It's like, oh, what happened? Huh? When I, when I zoomed in, the flash blue, I'm like, okay, fine. Knew it. It's coming. Usually on the lessons plan would say, make a mistake. Mm -hmm. huh? So if you want to redo this, let's redo it with 500 feet with the right selection. We don't have the time for that today. Yes, please. Redoing the buffer, if you're zoomed in on, say, like five addresses, and you're adding a buffer that's dissolved with connected bubbles, and you apply it and you zoom out, it only That's what it would do, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what we sure. Because, again, when we did this function, yeah. that little box down here, use yeah. current map extent. Yeah. It's a fail safe, so you don't blast through 1,000 points immediately. Uh, again, I had a project with 3 million points. It's a problem. Uh, it takes time. Uh, Again, if you do this, make sure that you select, like I did not do the right path, step by step, select the feature layer you want to use for, then you select the units. If you do it a different way, yeah, select the units, then select the table again, different table, the right table, switches to kilometers. Because kilometers, for some reason, is the default right now. 
that can throw you off visually. Mm -hmm. huh? All right. Any questions about this right now? Yes, I only, it only selected some of my things. Did you uncheck the box with the Yeah, and as a way to filter those, the book actually gives an example on, on query selection, so that I could filter those now for. It's demonstrated. Super simple. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, I just tease you guys to work on it, and then next week we actually go into detail. Huh? Uh, let's go next week. Let's do, let's do filtering next week. There's too much mind blowing because I want to switch the platform. I stress you guys out way too much with the next platform. Lily is like, what platform exactly? Here, this is the important part. If you uncheck that, the whole layer will be rendered. If you keep that checked, only those orange dots will be rendered. Yeah. All right, I, I will address that with you after the, uh, uh, in a break. Act, yeah. All right, I saved this guy. If you didn't name it yet, I called it Geocoding 2 uh, because we put the wrapper on there. All right, so now go, go back to the home button. In my ArcGIS. So this is all over the place right now because I messed up with my accounts when I checked on the students. But let's do this. Here, on these dot, 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 dot area. Remember, after the three, dot, three dots, there's a lot of more fun underneath it. I click on that, the app launcher. I'm going to go to business analyst. If I don't want to do it that way, I can also type in bao dot s3.com business analyst online see that bao .com. And since we are focusing on geocoding, finding things, putting things on a map, I think we're done with putting things on a map. Let's create other elements. Let's create a project, which looks here for you a little bit different. Let's go here for maps. In my case, create a new project for me. This will look different for you. What you want to do is you want to go to maps and then create a project. Let's call it fast food. It's about lunchtime. Uh, so, Business Analyst Online is a premium application from Esri. It is a mapping interface, but the richness of it is the huge database in the back. It has a reporting function that is mind blowing. Uh, and over the next few sessions, we are going to explore these databases and those reporting functions. Uh, there are standardized reports we can use. There are also customizable reports. I can build my own market report with my own features in it. 
if I'm only interested in population 55 and older, I can manipulate my report and I don't show the 16 year olds. So I can make this really specific for, let's say, my market analysis. Aha, everyone in real estate market analysis, final project, duh. That's the reason why I can use that account for a whole year. Everyone who does a team-based project, let's say development two, site development, retail functions, ta-da, take a look at that. Now, I can go, uh, I'm not sure if you can do this today, time-wise, but I literally can go in and say, in 10 minutes drive time from this university, what is the annual consumption of laundry detergent in terms of expenditure dollars? Yeah. I can drill it down like this. What's the medium income in 10 minutes? What are the comparable restaurants nearby? Yeah. Everything you can think of relating it to space and relationships to space, we are able to do in GIS and in ArcGIS Online, in ArcGIS Pro, and now in Business Analyst Online. We can tackle those problems and find solutions. Some are really easy, and some are really, really tricky and complicated. For the purpose of this class, we scratch the surface and play with it as much as possible on the easy parts. Huh? And remember, those are three systems. With your user account, through the cloud, there are three buckets you can interconnect. So the geocoding I've done in ArcGIS Online right now, that's James' uh, favorite, I can go now in my Arc Pro, click on portal, my content, and see those geocoded orange dots and can pull them down on my local map. Remember we did the Living Atlas example? It's the same thing like we would do a base map, images versus a street map. I can pull my data now from the portal, from the ArcGIS online world, down on my computer and vice versa. Huh? Here, I click open. Looks a little bit different. There are two or three tricks we have to learn. Everything else is easy going. Huh? I do encourage you guys to play with these here. It does recognize you that, hey, you haven't been around for a while, wanna play? Huh? The mapping interface looks pretty much the same, base map may be different, yeah? So, can zoom into our area, and for the purpose of this exercise, you will hear it more likely or very often, I'm zooming in into that kind of, here's that 27595 corridor, Everglades, what I call that, Everglades corner. I always try to zoom into that. Between, let's say, Griffin Road and Sunrise, that's my playground. No? Why? Because I don't want to do this US-wide. You don't see everything US-wide because of all the dots coming and it costs. Too many databases, too many database points. All right. So what you can see here is on the table of content, it organizes this slightly different than you have seen before. Huh? This is a tool, a, an application that doesn't care about if it looks nice and sexy. This is a tool that basically says, next, how many pounds of hamburgers and laundry detergent or automobile parts do you want? I have millions of dollars of expenditures to show in a report or the medium age is 25. I make that sexy looking, but not the map. Jose is like, huh? <laughs> so, all right. I take a look at this. So this is my project fast food. I can take a look at add data. I could go here, web maps and layers, import a file. Hey, we have done this before. Look, this is a simple for table turning into locations. Huh? or custom data setup. I also then could go in here with create maps, can colorize my maps, smart search maps, and what we're going to do is business and facility search. Huh? I also can go and define areas, find a location, select a geography, draw a polygon, find location 108 uh, Main Street, 
or 3301 College Avenue. If I want to do this, I can type in the address and you can see it will start searching for it and it'll find it for me. Knowing that this is the main administration building and not necessarily the middle of the campus. Yeah? I can call it NSU and I can go and say, hey, you know what? I'm interested in drive time, 5, 10, and 15 minutes around it. And apply that. Ta-da! Magic. Let's do this again. I went here, define areas, find location, plugged in my address, went to drive time, kept the default in 5, 10, and 15 minutes, yeah, and did hit apply. There are also more options. I can drive towards and away. I can set up even the traffic times. We're not going there. It's too confusing. 3301 College Avenue, Fort Lauderdale. So, what I just did with like five mouse clicks is I gave you a drive time buffer analysis. Like we did the 500 feet around the addresses. This is driving along the street network for five, 10, and 15 minutes. Remember we had the we did bad things maps with the drive time? This would have taken me two days to render back in the days. Yeah. Bam, we dropped this for three different drive times right now. Now I can use run reports and would get reports for five, 10, and 15 minutes distance. Have we done that yet before? What do I mean with reports? Okay, let's do this. I think I showed it in the last five minutes in the first session. Run reports. <clears throat> Business Analyst Online sets up predefined reports for us. Yeah? I can do my own reports. We're testing this later. Yeah? Or standardized reports. You can scroll down. There are a lot. Yeah? Here's restaurant market potential as an example. There are also infographics. We're going to get to that. So, if I would now click the 2010 census profile, it will tell me, hey, for this so-called site we just created, always wants to know sites. Could be geography, a zip code. You define this as a site. The five minutes drive time right now will be a site. Yeah? And you say run now. It might load up here. Yeah? And I click open report. Okay. Before we go into this report, let's walk this workflow step by step through. Lily, you following me? I created a project. I went into the project. Like I said, with my mapping tools, create at a location. I typed in my address, type, defined my drive time, applied that, created my site, and then I said run a report and came to that screen here. Yeah. For that current selected site, you can see selected site one. Yep. I said the S3 standard report for census profile. If you activate that, it runs over here. I can run multiples. I can run this also as Excel and use it then in an, as an Excel table if I would like to copy edit that for a write up. Huh? A Randy report and open it pops up in a different window. Important part it shows you the site name here. Also shows you right now the five minutes. If you scroll down further, it will switch to 10 minutes. And at the end, even the 15 minutes. Yeah? It also then 
we'll go through all the setup, how this template was built. We're going to do that later. We're going to customize our reports. Why? Because I might not want to know all the population by age as a breakdown. I want to know only, let's say, population by race. race. I might only want to have the first four or five blocks. You know? What else is in there? Household by type, family household by size, non-family household by size. Here, those are you guys living in shared apartments. You know? If you look family household by age, etc. You know, where am I? I'm here. 99 people, 4%. Just kidding. Yeah. So you can see I might not need all of that information for the three zones I just created, for the three coverage drive times. If I do another support, another run, let's say uh, community profile, run now, open the report, different summary, different household summary. So there might be some cool stuff in one report, and then the other report has some cool stuff. I want to add that together at some point. We can do that. We can build customized reports. Uh, that's the reason why I have here, if I scroll up, I have a bunch of self-made re custom reports. Yeah, it's alcoholic data. So that's the reason why it's called booze. I'm writing paper about booze. Uh, taxation data is awesome. So, any questions about that? Again, let's do it again. I would go, let's say, back to fast food. No, it's important to know this. Get rid of this. Is that, again, this problem with the window? Yeah. Gesundheit. Go back to maps. Here we go. Yeah. What if I did this find location? What if, if I'm just interested in, in two or three zip codes? Give a damn about drive time. Go classic. Submarkets. All this. Select geography. Pops up a different side window. Are you are you all with me on this? Okay. Clicking with me? Okay, good. So this is my first site I had here. Yeah, I can do search, select from app, or select a full list. Let's say like this. If I do the full list, this is like the Census Bureau and all the geog geography units as a breakdown. Yeah, I have the United States. I can select by states, counties, zip codes, census tracts, block groups, designated mark, congressional district, what. Ever you want to go the route to, for your data. In real estate, doubt that we are dealing with congressional districts. No? But we could go with zip codes. If you click on zip codes, yeah, it will ask me a few things. Select the state. Well, I'm in Florida. Select the county. Well, we're in Broward. Yeah, I actually expected that it shows my zip codes, but it doesn't. So now I could actually go by zip code here, Davy. Here we go. And click on just for the city of Davy. Or I can say Hollywood. Hi, Dania. Did I tell you that I didn't don't wear my glasses today? I can do Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood. Yeah as an example, the four of Hollywood right now. It's interesting because it shows, listen, this is the zip code for Hollywood shown, but it shows as Miramar on the map. Yeah. Do you want to combine ge geographies into one site? Yes, no. Well, if I have those four selected zip codes for Hollywood, yes, I want to keep them selected as one site. I create one coverage. It's like, well, this is one zip code paper here. This is one zip code paper here. 
I want to use them all combined as one when I put the data on top of it. Okay? Make sense? Everyone has the yes button activated? Click next. Yeah. Now it says four zip codes. I can click on this one and say four zip Hollywood. Yeah. Doesn't matter right now. The important thing is that you understand I can select three, four, five, and then combine them in one unit. No? So I nicknamed that Hollywood with spelling errors from above. Hollywood. Hollywood. Okay. I could run reports here, organize sites, I click done. So now if I hover over my map, you can see I'm half this active and it says reports. It says infographics. I could edit my data area as well. So if I do reports, it comes back to the same overview we had earlier, remember? Just in a different form. I can go now and say my community profile for this, run my report. Run it. Might take a moment. Processing, finally. Open report. So now this is my community profile. Again, same template we have seen. Yeah? Community profile for the daily drive time. Community profile for our Hollywood zip codes. Same template, different coverage of a geographic area. Super straightforward. Nothing complicated. Complicated part is you have to manage around what kind of geographic unit you are going to select here with the cool with the idea of defined areas. Yeah? Here these guys. All right. Infographics. Let's get rid of this guy here so we have more space. Infographics. Really cool overview. <clears throat> Think about this like a brochure. All the table data is pimped out into funny looking graphics. There's actually um, folks from the real estate sector and at Esri, they are doing fantastic infographics. Huh? Um, take a look at that, they are blogging about it. Really nice work. Helen Thompson, that's her name. So we can have here infographics, we have all other versions of this one. Let's see if actually she picks up Firefly. Nope. Don't have to load it. So, let's say run just demographic profile here again. Yeah, in demographic summary for infographic and say, click save. Takes a moment. Builds it. Now, this is with, an implement, with the interactive map implemented. These are our highlighted zip codes. We selected as an area. This is the breakdowns for all of those guys. Population, median age, education. You also can click on this as well and get detailed breakdowns interactively. Yeah. Very playful, very easy, very streamlined for the consumer who doesn't want to do a whole day on demographics. You only are interested in, hey, what is the median age? What's the median household income per zip code? Very fast, very easy to do. How oh. do you have to do the Here, infographics. I can do the same thing for this one here. Remember, I have two different sites right now. Click on this side. Doesn't like me right now. Of course it doesn't like me right now. To run analysis. Define areas. I did that. Fast. Let's go this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Typically it kicks on that. No, that's the zip codes. 
uh, through my through my site out. But that's okay. Let's do this again. Define areas, find location, have view, uh, drive time, organize sites. Give me a moment. I don't like that it kicked my drive time out. Define area, find location, do this again, do this again, apply. Ah, here we go. Now it's active. I can do this for my uh, university site as well, do infographics, takes a moment, and now because I played with the key facts, uh, sorry, with the demographic summary, it will actually come in with the demographic summary right now. This is the demographic summary for the five minutes drive time. And I can choose, let's say, the income here and get that table breakdown even with certain trends and differences. Um, I do encourage you guys to play with this. Uh, I will spend in class 10, 15 minutes maximum per session. Uh, as in, let's fire up summer, summary demographics for infographic, key facts, uh, maybe expenditures. That's as far as I go. Because there's so many variations of it I encourage you guys within this class or after the class, test those pieces out. They are beneficial for the other classes. You can use all of this for educational purposes. Did have a student in summer asking, hey, I have three months left on the account. Can I use that for my real estate company? And I said, nah, it's educational purposes. But I'm learning things. I'm like, ah, it's educational purposes. Yeah. So I can't control that. But in the good old days, usually you would get, I see what you do. Remember, everything you click in here, I can see. If you're running suddenly uh, 20 reports for property in Miramar and it's not related to a study project, uh, yeah, it's a study license, education license, not commercial use. That's, that's as far as I can appeal, uh, appeal on you guys. Run projects, test this out, play with it. The more often you play, the more often you run into a wall. The, therefore, you learn how to get out of here. How do I get out of here? Oh, I click all over the place. Yeah? By luck, you click outside. Well, maybe you find that X here. Maybe you know escape key might help as well. Boom, boom, two times escape key and I'm gone. Yeah? Helps with the handling of the software and the framework you're in. Okay? Um, one more thing, really cool. That's number one, playlist. That's one of the coolest things you can do. You said, let's do a new, uh, that's fine, it's, we don't worry about the drive time. Create maps, business facility search. Who's in my real estate market analysis class? Everyone pretty much. All right. Are you already in the session with the Nikes codes, employment data, Douglas County, Colorado? Some people who did the class, it's like, oh yeah, we remember. Well, let's take a look at Nikes codes. Nikes codes, North American Information System, Industry System, Coding System. Huh? That's also SIC. Huh? Think about this, it's like a zip code for a business description. As in, Restaurants would be like seven two two subcategories, huh? Uh, kind of big blocks organized in warehousing, manufacturing, from medical, all these major categories, huh? We can do regional economic analysis with that, with those based on employment data, huh? What's going on, James? You doing okay? Ah, good luck that I record that stuff. And I'm available for office hours and talk. Oh, speaking of office hours and talk. So this morning I actually had a conversation with Dr. Foggy. Hashtag things you discuss at 7 a.m. in the office on Saturdays. If you, he was there at seven, uh, 6. If you want to talk about anything you want, we have an open door policy. Yes, we have office hours. His office hours are Monday pretty much. Monday to Friday, pretty much every morning. 
The moment he walks in, he's available for you, unless he's running out to a meeting. I'm a little bit more distinct. I post office hours for specific hours, but if that doesn't fit into your calendar and something urgent, yes, we can make arrangements. We can also have a conversation on the phone or FaceTime if needed, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, if you live in Miami and you want to come up and talk to me for 10 minutes, but you probably spent two hours in traffic, that is not beneficial for your time and your education. So we just have a phone call. Yeah. Some of this stuff is graphic intense. So I do appreciate the two or three students who had issues and screenshot and say, hey, I'm looking at this right now. Can you help me with this? And I'm looking at this like, yeah, you're on the wrong menu. Yeah. Or you're looking actually at the folder, not at the program. Can be really in within two or three minutes, even at midnight in the middle of the night. Yeah. That's okay. Screenshot this whole thing and then send, attach it to an email with a question. Saves you a trip to campus. The reason why I address this, we have different levels of advising and conversation about your study plans. Fred and I are the internal experts on what's going on in the classes and content and difficult levels. So in combination with your advisors, academic advisors, and us, please talk to us. If you struggle in classes, workload, intensity, etc., talk to us and your academic advisor. Huh? Technically, we don't have the academic advising function with the faculty member. That's the person on the first floor. However, there is sometimes some disconnect. And before your excellence in learning suffers from that disconnect, talk to all of us. The reason why I come up with this is because I had a student drop this week with the courtesy to just tell me she's not going to be in my class. Didn't state why, but this email read, talk to my academic advisor, dropping. I have no idea. Did I do something wrong? Did the program do something wrong? Was the workload, personal life, combinations of such, a cause of friction, of stress, distress. So please, I am 100% sure I'm not the nicest guy in the classroom with my demands for your knowledge experience. Some people call me mean. No, it's just wrong perception. My nickname is Happy. Yeah? So I have demands in workload and in your, let's say, practice time. Yeah? So I have certain demands in that. I'm raising the bar. I have the assistant dean saying, you put the fear of God into your students when it comes to presentations. I'm like, yep, because they get an excellent grade that they earn after they go through all this training exercise. Huh? She also writes an email to all faculty members in the college and saying, you better look at the YouTube channel, Thomas Students and Presentations, the best she has seen in the whole college when she did the assessment. She was in every college presentation in that month was about a year, two years ago. So I'm trying to live up to that level. Huh? So you will see this in this class and the other classes you're taking on the ground, ground, on the ground with me. I'm going to drill that into you guys again. Very slowly, clear into the microphone. Black background, white font, 12 size. I will walk out. This is not a PowerPoint. This is a nightmare. Huh? 12 size. 12 size. That size. I will walk out. Huh? Oh, you mean with a paragraph, with a clickable paragraph? To get the message, okay? Um, <clears throat> because we had this about call, uh, advising. This is important, guys. Yeah? We are here to facilitate your learning, to make your learning experience over a whole year, every Saturday, a great mix between nightmares, stress and struggle, and happiness. Yeah? After one year in this program, you come out of this program and say, yes, it was worth it. All the pain, all the struggles, I learned a lot. I'm a proud alumni of MSRED, and I can make, I can compete in the industry and can actually make really good money and good jobs. Yeah? We just had two, you might know them, we had two alumni creating a company. They just hired two weeks ago one other alumni of this last year's class 
to develop with her more projects. Yeah? So it's all about networking and staying in contact, but also being excellent in the things you do. Oh yeah, speaking of excellence, give me, because we had some troubles today, give me like four more minutes to tease you with this. Not including this in the next exam. Huh? But I need you to play with this and tease you with that. So if I want to look for a business, zoom in a little bit so we don't get too many. It says enter business facility name or type. Well, I could type in fast food. Fast food. Reword. Yeah. Wait. What's fast food? It's McDonald's, is it? McDonald's. Yeah. But hey, listen. Look, I have McDonald's, L McDonald, McDonald Enterprises, GT McDonald's. I have it in all different places. And I don't have Burger King with that or all the other things. If I search by, let's say, go back. Great map again, business. Let's say if I search for restaurant, doesn't like me. Yeah? So I need to scroll, go back here. This is bad on my screen. I could go back here now also. Do restaurant, not just a filter, but a search. Click go. Well, now I have a Subway, Burger Kings, a Wendy's, fine, IHOP, Denny's, Tijuana Flats. Um, probably have YOLO in there as well, where we do our um, network event. It's not very specific right now. So the Nike codes help. I'll uh, do this as a lookup next time. I happen to know, let's go back. I happen to know the Nike's code for McDonald's, 722-511. It's one of those numbers you never forget. I got it, got it here in the notes. And I can limit this, let's say, on 1,000 search results. Click OK. Now I get a subway to McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, IHOP. Everyone that is kind of listed in that pattern yeah, as a location. I want you to take a look at Nike's codes, like literally Google Nike's codes, and play with that search function. Why? Because now we could go and say, listen, I take this one here, create buffers around it, drive time, and would get a different drive time analysis of this guy. Let's do a report. Let's say community profile again, run the report. Now I got the re community profile neck for that McDonald's location, for that chap that's actually the Japanese buffet across the street. This is what they have in 15 minutes drive time. They're looking at a total of about 470,000 daytime population that potentially could shop there. Okay? Have a great day. Again, this is the reason why we have these 3,000 points. You can make some damage with this. We use today maybe five or six points. Huh? So play with this. Explore the zoom in, zoom out functions, how to set up a site, how to delete a site, how to rename them, how to deal with all these buffers. Uh, we're going to do more details next week. Have a good time. We are not, we are not, the, the Nike's code search function is not part of next week's quiz. The search function I demonstrated is not part of next week's quiz. The geocoding part is the buffers are. That gives enough damage. We can geocode, we can do buffers. That's good enough for the beginning. That's part of it, yeah.
we going to, is it the same the online 